continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to welcome back Jay Dickey. Jay is the president of American Heritage Partners, a Nevada nonprofit organization dedicated to conducting educational programs on topics related to American history. Jay is past president of the Nevada Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. He also serves as governor of the Nevada Mayflower Society, lieutenant governor of the Northern California Company of the Jamestown Society, and the treasurer of the Nevada Society of the Order of Founders of, excuse me, the Order of Founders and Patriots of America. He is a frequent author and lecturer on topics related to early American history. Today's talk is entitled Children of Light, the History and Genealogy of Quakerism in Early America. Jay has a special interest in this topic because he has several New England ancestors who were Quakers in the 1600s in Massachusetts. As we continue to strive for religious freedom in America and to uphold the Constitution's First Amendment guarantees of freedom of religion, it's important to remember the history of early America's struggles for religious freedom and specifically the courageous efforts of our first immigrant ancestors who were members of the Society of Friends and who sought to practice their faith in the face of widespread persecution. Jay will talk about the rise of Quakerism in England in the mid 1600s, led by George Fox and the later establishment of the Quaker faith in America, led by William Penn. Jay will also discuss the genealogical records available for further research into your Quaker ancestors. So I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Jay. Thank you, Suzanne. I wanna thank Truckee Meadows Community College for inviting me back uh, once again to uh, uh, talk to you about uh, American history and various uh, stripes. Uh, as president of American Heritage Partners, uh, I am pleased that we are able to uh, bring talks like this one uh, to the public on a range of topics that kind of fall between the chairs of the usual lineage societies, such as the SAR, such as the Mayflower, uh, such as uh, the Civil War veterans. Uh, our goal uh, as a, as a uh, company, let me see if I can do that, our mission is really to fill in the interstices uh, of the American story that isn't otherwise being covered, uh, particularly ones that are, uh, I believe, of just profound impact on our American history and our American story. We do a wide range of in-person uh, and online uh uh, programs such as this one. Uh, last uh, week, uh, we hosted an in-person event here in uh, Reno uh, with the education direct, director of education of the Salem Witch Museum, uh, which was very well attended, really interesting. Uh, a tragic story uh, that seems to have been so forgotten. Uh, and so we were pleased to do that. Uh, we also have started a, a program of making uh, grants and scholarships. Uh, last week, we announced uh, a, a grant to a, a group, a nonprofit called Jamestown Rediscovery, not the Jamestown Society, but Jamestown Rediscovery, which are the archaeologists at Jamestown uh, who are doing just unbelievable work in uh, fleshing out the story of the Jamestown settlement. They continue to make discoveries, and it's that kind of work that American Heritage Partners wants to support uh, with its grants, uh, and we'll be looking for more opportunities in the future uh, to do that. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, in today's email that Suzanne sent out with the Zoom link for this talk, at the very bottom there is a PDF of a reading list uh, that I put together of a, a couple of dozen of the leading books uh, about the Quaker faith, the history of Quakerism um, in England and Europe and America. Uh, there are a few, of the, a few of the books on that list uh, you can find in the TMCC library. Uh, one of the leading books that seems to be cited repeatedly is uh, by Lisa Perry Arnold entitled Thee and Me, A Beginner's Guide to Early Quaker Records. Uh, that is in the TMCC library, as is the book entitled Tracing Your Nonconformist Ancestors by Stuart Raymond. Uh, just many, many books, and I'll refer to a couple other uh, uh, books along the way uh, during this uh, talk. Uh, lastly, I want to say that uh, 
at the end of uh, my talk, uh, Suzanne will, I will give Suzanne uh, this slide deck uh, to make available to you all. I warn you that it is very densely packed with information uh, on purpose uh, so that you don't have to take a lot of notes as we go. Just understand that uh, my uh, the information in my deck uh, will be available uh, afterwards. We will also post it to the American Heritage Partners website, uh, which is AmericanHeritagePartners.org. Uh, so look for it there if you need it right away. So uh, the title of the talk, uh, uh, Children of the Light, uh, is a reference to how uh, the Society of Friends originally referred to themselves. Uh, they were not Quakers. They were children of the light. Their faith was uh, often uh, and described as worshiping the inner light or the inward light. Uh, those were uh, how uh, they described themselves. The word Quaker, interestingly enough, was a derogatory term, uh, which uh, the English uh, Anglicans, uh, the Church of England leaders, uh, like to use to basically poo-poo uh, this new faith that was emerging uh, in the uh, mid-1600s, uh, Quakerism meaning these people quake in the face of God uh, as in their kind of uh, out of their minds. Uh, that was kind of the implication of that word. Of course, today we don't assign it or ascribe to it that derogatory sense, but uh, they didn't call themselves Quakers. Uh, you see here the basic tenets of the faith. Some of them sound very much like uh, your original um, Calvinist uh, theology, uh, most notably uh, the uh, original Quaker doctrine uh, did everything it could to not... <laughs> be associated with Catholicism. That included you know, no popes, no ordained ministers, no baptisms, uh, no oath-taking. Uh, that was a, a significant part of the theology. Plain English, uh, these and thous, those words were you know, considered kind of too plain for the aristocracy, for the, uh, uh, for the moneyed classes in England and Ireland and Scotland, where the faith first took root. Quietism, uh, the services, which weren't in churches, they were in people's homes, uh, mostly consisted of quiet reflection, quiet prayer, not sermons, uh, not ministers delivering uh, sermons or or what have you. It was a, it was a, a a theology of quietism. That translated also into the you know, social aspects of Quakerism, modest dress. Uh, they refused, you see on this uh, slide, no bowing or doffing of the hat. Part of the culture, part of the societal norms was if you walk down the street and your, your superior was walking in, in, towards you, you needed to bow and doff your hat. Well, the Quakers didn't believe in that. Uh, they also, importantly, believed in uh, a sense of equality for women. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later on in my talk, but uh, uh, unlike uh, even the Calvinist faith, you know, women were heard from. Women participated directly uh, in the practice of uh, the uh, uh, Quaker faith. Over time, they developed a very formal structure of monthly, quarterly, and yearly meetings. This will be important on the genealogy front because it is the records of those monthly, quarterly, and yearly meetings, which is the real meat of your genealogical research today uh, to the extent that those records have been kept. And I'm here to say a lot of them have uh, going back in time. So it is a rich uh, resource uh, for genealogists looking into uh, their uh, Quaker ancestry. We know, I, I think most of us know, that they also were uh, pacifists of the highest order. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And also, over time, developed a very abolitionist 
um, uh, 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 approach, uh, particularly in America where slavery was you know, so prominent. So I wanna talk briefly uh, as a kind of a lead in uh, before the mid 1600s, of course, most of us know that the early years of uh, America, New England in particular, uh, religious persecution certainly existed, particularly in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which were you know, just strict adherence to the, to, uh, the Puritan uh, theology. Uh, that meant uh, that if you did not uh, toe the line uh, to uh, the Puritan uh, uh, dictates, uh, you were deemed a heretic. You were a nonconformist. You could be persecuted. You could be fined. You could be imprisoned. You could be banished uh, from the colony. Uh, so that was a, a very powerful presence in early New England, in particular, as we uh, lead towards the beginning uh, of the development of the Quaker uh, faith. It was also you know, very prominent throughout Europe, of course. Uh, certainly, France was guilty as charged of massive persecution of Protestants. We know that from uh, the 1500s and the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, uh, just massacring uh, Protestants in the streets. Uh, and it wasn't just Catholics uh, persecuting Protestants, it was Protestants persecuting Protestants. Uh, so there were so many different um, uh, uh, sects, if you will, uh, of the Protestant faith that were uh, in disagreement with each other over basic theological principles and persecution uh, was inherent in all of that too. And that all got, of course, exported to America uh, and uh, was you know, very entrenched uh, as we head into the uh, 1650s. Uh, we see, as this slide indicates, a series of uh, acts that were um, uh, approved by the, the various kings of England during the second half of the 1600s, you know, beginning with uh, the Quaker Act of 1662, which is, as its name implied, uh, targeting Quakers, uh, along with the Conventicle, Conventicle Act of 1664, uh, shortly on its heels, the Second Conventicle Act, 1673, the Test Acts, I'm not going to read every word on these slides. You can you can read them and, and get the slide afterwards. But uh, England was very uh, uh, methodical uh, about uh, legislating uh, and setting rules of conduct that targeted uh, the Quaker faith. You know, why did the Test Acts uh, target faith uh, Quakers? Well, Quakers didn't believe in oath taking, and the Test Act required guess what? An oath in order to participate uh, in uh, uh, any uh, government office. Uh, so essentially the Test Acts uh, guaranteed that no Quakers would ever hold office uh, in England unless they violated their faith and took an oath. Later on, uh, as I indicate here, uh, when we, we went from King Charles II to King William II, uh, his brother, uh, he was a Catholic, and uh, because he was a Catholic, there was a wave of anti-Catholic hysteria in England uh, targeting the king uh, and ultimately ousting him in 1688 because of that. So the climate of religious intolerance was rampant, uh, both in England and America during the second half of the 1600s. And in the midst of that emerges George Fox, uh, really considered the father of uh, the Society of Friends, uh, the father of Quakerism. They called him the first father. Uh, and he began formulating the Quaker theology in 1647 and in 1652 uh, had a vision, happened to occur on a hill in England called Pendle Hill. He had a vision of, of God uh, working through uh, the, the, the human body, in effect, that inner light we talked about, the children of the light, uh, was his postulation of God working through every single person, not through ministers, not through popes, but through themselves, 
the inner light being uh, in everybody to be discovered. And that was the vision he had in 1652. Uh, and he led this uh, quite uh, vigorously, uh, following his vision, traveling all over England, traveling all over Ireland, traveling to Europe, uh, preaching preaching this new faith. And as you as you uh, can imagine, uh, his, his following grew and grew and grew as he traveled, uh, almost a traveling minister, but he didn't call, he wasn't a minister. He was a person uh, who who had a had a different view than the Church of England had about uh, what the Bible meant, uh, what Jesus Christ uh, was was all about and how we should worship uh, him and God uh, in our daily lives. Along the way, he met and fell in love to married Margaret Fell. And I mentioned how uh, the Quaker faith uh, really emphasized the equality of women. Margaret Fell was not just a wife. She was a leader in her own right. And she was side by side with George Fox, uh, preaching the faith, uh, going out into the communities and being very active uh, as essentially a co-leader of this uh, a uh, new faith that George Fox was had developed and was now uh, spreading the word. Uh, he went uh, to the uh, Americas, I'll call it, Barbados in particular, shortly thereafter, spent three months in Barbados pre uh, pre preaching essentially there. And Barbados is one of the richer historical places where the Quaker faith first developed in the Americas, my Quaker ancestor in New England actually uh, was convinced, that's the word they used, converted, uh, they call it convinced. He was convinced and became a Quaker in Barbados when he was living there and before he came back to New England. So there's quite a bit of literature, some of which is in the TMCC library about what was happening in Barbados in this particular time period. And then of course he came to uh, North America and traveled for uh, a couple of years, spreading the word uh, in the 1670s. Uh, and it just took on a life of its own essentially. Uh, he died many years later. Uh, one of the most uh, highly regarded early texts about Quakerism was his journal that he kept, not published until after he died, but uh, today historians find uh, great um, uh, resources on the early faith uh, in his journal, which is still available. You can go to hathitrust.org or uh, archives.org, and, and it's available there, or you can buy it on Amazon. Today, there is a university in his name, uh, happens to be in Oregon, and I haven't quite figured out why it's in Oregon, but they have three campuses in Oregon of George Fox University. It has a website with interesting both historical and genealogical content on it. Uh, so in the Americas, as I mentioned, you know, there were certainly persecutions uh, going on before George Fox uh, brought forth uh, the, the Quaker faith. Uh, it continued, but now with a particular focus on Quakers. And as you see here, uh, the Quakers were not only persecuted, they were hanged uh, in New England in 1659 uh, uh, through 61. Uh, uh, four Quakers were, were hung, others were banished, others were imprisoned. Uh, New England was not friendly Massachusetts Bay Colony in particular, not friendly uh, to the Quaker faith. Virginia was also uh, an established Church of England uh, colony. Uh, it also uh, persecuted Quakers. Uh, the leader of the Quaker faith down there, George Wilson, was imprisoned in Jamestown in the 1660s. Uh, Maryland also uh, was a, a, a place that uh, uh, antagonized Quakers who had crossed the border from Virginia, escaping uh, persecution in Virginia. Well, you know, Maryland uh, just picked up the ball and ran with it and it was raiding settlements and uh, ousting Quakers from uh, the, the Maryland colony at that time. Uh, oddly, and this was an interesting fact I stumbled on, Roger Williams we think of as one of the classic nonconformists of early America, and he was. He was a 
preacher in Massachusetts Bay Colony who incurred the wrath of the leaders of the of the colony, and he was uh, um, uh, kicked out. He was uh, banished from Massachusetts Bay Colony. He went to Rhode Island, uh, founded the uh, uh, the uh, plantation there, the Providence Plantation, which became a haven uh, for nonconformists of all types. Uh, so you would think of all people, Roger Williams would be extremely um, supportive and sympathetic of this new nonconformist faith called Quakerism. And yet in 1672, he took, he took George Fox on when George was in uh, New England. He wrote a treatise that attacked Quakerism, attacked George Fox, and tried to seek him out and have a face-to-face -face debate uh, with him. Fox wisely uh, stepped away from that uh, fracas. Uh, but uh, in, in Rhode Island, Roger Williams was looking for trouble uh, with George Fox. So it gives you a sense of the tenor of things in this time period of the latter part of uh, the 1600s. Lots of tension in America over this emerging uh, faith. Long comes... Uh, William Penn. Uh, we we know him if we know him uh, if, because the state of Pennsylvania uh, was the original colony that uh, that he founded. Uh, footnote: Pennsylvania was not named for him. It was named for his father, who was an admiral in in the English Navy, who became a very close confidant of King Charles II. Uh, he led many uh, military um, uh, expeditions uh, during the reign of Charles II. And it was actually Charles II who suggested that the name Penn be uh, attached to this new colony. Uh, William Penn wanted to call it Sylvania. And the king said, no, 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 let's call it Pennsylvania. So that's how it came to get that name. It wasn't from William Penn, the Quaker. It was from his father. Uh, William Penn, uh, the son, uh, like his father, established very close ties to the English monarchy. Charles II and him uh, were, were close friends. Uh, king James II, uh, then a prince, was a close friend of William Penn. So William Penn started out in sort of a, the aristocratic circles of England before he became a nonconformist and persona non grata. He proceeded to author many uh, important uh, texts, broadsides, papers, what have you, uh, that uh, proselytized for the Quaker faith and took issue uh, with the Church of England and the Anglican faith, 1669, he authors No Cross, No Crown, probably one of his best known works. Uh, shortly thereafter, he was jailed. Not the first time, he would be, not the only time he would be jailed. He was jailed several times during his life. Uh, while in jail, he wrote The Great Case of Liberty of Conscience, one of the seminal uh, texts ever written. Uh, and uh, historians consider it one of his greatest works. Again, both of these are available on Trust or archives.org if you care to read them. Uh, and starting in about 1675, Penn starts to get this concept of the possibility of exporting Quakerism uh, in, in a more ordered way, a more official way to America. Quakers were already there, as I've discussed, uh, but Penn now set his sights on uh, developing a colony there. And by 1681, uh, he had persuaded uh, Charles II to grant him a charter to do precisely that. And so he was given a uh, charter, so to speak, to uh, thousands of acres, thousands of square miles of land uh, in uh, the middle Atlantic between New York and Maryland uh, to establish uh, what became the Pennsylvania colony. And he went there uh, and spent about two years uh, starting uh, that colony. And we'll get to what happened when he uh, decided to leave and come back in a second. Uh, you'll see here that you know, the, the, while there was a, a glimmer of progress being made uh, during uh, 
the reign of Charles II to uh, allow uh, the Quakers to have their colony, there was still persecution going on. And when Charles II died and was uh, re replaced uh, by uh, his uh, uh, his son William II, and then, excuse me, William III, and then William III was ousted. Uh, excuse me, James III was ousted. William III comes in uh, to assume the crown, and that's called the Glorious Revolution. Uh, what do they do? They jail him again, uh, and they stripped him of his charter in 1691. Now he no longer is the proprietor of the Pennsylvania uh, colony, and he decides the better part of valor is to go into hiding. So it was a a, a, a precipitate. It was a Dangerous time for William Penn uh, and and his uh, Quakerism uh, in the new post glorious Revo revolution uh, England. Here's two uh, uh, front pages of the books I mentioned: No Cross, No Crown, uh, The Great Case of Liberty of Conscience. Again, available online. Uh, in the late 1600s, despite him being jailed, Quakerism was spreading. It was spreading to the continent, uh, the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, Penn had gone there on two uh, tours uh, to Germany and the Netherlands and elsewhere. Uh, and now it was being exported significantly to the West Indies. I mentioned Barbados and Cape Cod and Rhode Island were becoming uh, uh, centers of the Quaker faith in the late 1600s. And we see now a series of uh, declarations uh, being issued to perhaps uh, give some leeway to the Quaker faith to develop the Declaration of Indulgence of 1672, uh, the Declaration of Liberty of Conscience uh, in 1687, the Toleration Act in 1689. It was toleration only to a degree, as you see in my slide, uh, they decided, you know, they would tolerate to a degree uh, nonconformists, but not Catholics. So Catholics were excluded from the Toleration Act. And then the Affirmation Act in 1696 basically allowed affirmations instead of oaths to the Quakers. This was a big deal. They could now hold government office by, by way of affirmation. They would not be required to make an oath. So uh, that was a very important uh, act as we end uh, the 17th century in England. Uh, there was also uh, along the way, uh, as part of what he was now trying to do in, in Pennsylvania, uh, a charter of the province of Pennsylvania and city of Philadelphia that was issued uh, to uh, uh, William Penn in 1682. You see a copy of the charter here on the left. Uh, you see a painting uh, probably not from real life, but a depiction uh, of the charter being given uh, to William Penn to uh, head off to America and start the colony of Pennsylvania, which is what he uh, did. In the tail end of the 1600s, the 1690s to be specific, uh, the first father, George Fox, dies in 1691, and Penn essentially uh, assumes that standard bearer role uh, in the faith, both in England and Europe and America. And yet, as I mentioned, he's jailed. Uh, he's the leader of the faith, but he's jailed. He's released. He goes into hiding. Uh, finally, through the efforts of many, many well-placed people uh, surrounding uh, the new uh, royals, uh, William and Mary, uh, they persuade William and Mary to exonerate him from any charges of treason and to release him from jail. And most importantly, to restore the proprietorship of the colony to him. Uh, and that was important because while he was being jailed, uh, the uh, Anglicans uh, in America obviously would love to take over that colony and take the land and take the economic opportunities. And they were proceeding to try to do that uh, until uh, King William uh, restored the proprietorship to uh, William Penn. At the end of the century, uh, a revised, updated frame of government is uh, instituted by the uh, Pennsylvania Assembly. It's not 
necessarily to William Penn's liking. It's maybe granting a little bit too much power to this assembly. He had pretty much absolute power, autocratic power under the original frame of government in 1683. Uh, so essentially the assembly was saying, we like you, but we want to have a little bit more power uh, than you've been giving us uh, over these last uh, two decades. So that was put into place. And uh, it, while he, this was all while he was still in England, he sees that he needs to go back and try to either right the ship or at least put some more controls on it so that the original intent of having essentially a Quaker haven, a Quaker colony is protected. It was still heavily controlled by Quakers, but over time, you know, many, many uh, non-Quakers were starting to play leadership roles in the colony. Finally, in 1701, uh, seeing the handwriting on the walls, I guess I'd say Penn decides he's going to uh, issue uh, what you see here, uh, described uh, as uh, the Charters of Privileges. And that was essentially uh, you know, a much more full-scale uh, revision to the government structures in Pennsylvania. Uh, it granted more explicit freedom of religion that had never existed. It granted the right to hold public office. Uh, so long as you at least professed uh, to believe in Jesus Christ, uh, a, a new assembly was created, uh, and you know other uh, uh, other new uh, laws instituted to give more uh, say uh, to the citizens of the colony. And in the first half of the 1700s, uh, over time, Penn's role is kind of diminishing. Uh, he he's had all kinds of personal issues uh, over these decades. I've been talking about. Uh, besides the fact that his wife died and he remarried uh, a woman way younger than him, which caused a lot of uh, eyes to open. Uh, he also was extraordinarily in debt. Um, he had invested so much money that he didn't have in building the Pennsylvania colony uh, that he ended up going to debtor's prison in 1708. Uh, he was finally you know, released through the uh, efforts of friends to help pay off his debts. Uh, then in 1712, he had a series of strokes, which basically incapacitated him for the rest of his life. So as we go into the 1700s, uh, Penn is, you know, the leader in name only and other, uh, other um, people are coming into leadership roles like uh, George uh, uh, Whitefield, who became a, a, a big name in the in the faith as uh, time went on. Uh, the society also was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the fact that many Quakers owned slaves. It was you know, a very typical, regular, uh, non-controversial thing for the first hundred years of the Quaker faith that Quaker leaders, including William Penn, had slaves. Uh, a lot of people uh, naturally had problems with that. And over time, uh, an abolitionist um, uh, uh, sense uh, started to come into play in the in the world of Quakerism in America. Finally, in 1755, the the uh, uh, Society of Friends banishes slavery altogether. Uh, although in the South, much like our Civil War, much later, uh, slaves were still pretty prevalent, even among uh, Quakers in the South and Virginia was very staunchly uh, against uh, any attempts by the Quaker faith to abolish slavery in the South, even though it had been officially banned, nobody was enforcing it. Over the same time period, Quakers were becoming, you know, not nonconformists, not heretics, but, you know, an integral part of American commerce. They had businesses, they were merchants, uh, they were traders. Uh, they were farmers, and the Quaker faith spread not just to the South, but out into the Northwest Territory, Ohio Territory, and so forth. And uh, among other uh, uh, areas, the uh, Ohio uh, Valley, which was at the time, you know, one of the hotly uh, desirable 
uh, areas of the country that the colonists wanted to move into. They were moving into it. George Washington was moving into it. So were the Quakers. So the Quakers were following opportunity uh, during this time period before the revolution. Important development uh, was that in the American Revolution, because the Quakers were pacifists, they chose a as a faith to uh, not side with either uh, the rebels uh, or uh, the British, uh, but uh, and they did that through many ways. One is they didn't involve themselves in any of the military uh, militias or the Continental Army. They weren't soldiers. They uh, couldn't be soldiers under their theology. Uh, they would even not give food to the rebels if they came through the village. Uh, they were starving. They wanted to get some food from a Quaker farmer. Uh, that would be refused. And so you can imagine what the rebels thought of that. They, in turn, and you know, tit for tat, persecuted American Quakers who refused to support them in the cause. And this went on throughout the uh, throughout the war, they were viewed as loyalists and the enemy. Uh, on its own side, uh, the society uh, was quick to banish, uh, to oust members who did support the cause. And in a moment, I'll talk about a couple of those examples, but it was a very uh, tense uh, time for Quakerism in America during the revolution because they were the enemy. Uh, after the, after the war, things simmered down. The rest of the 1700s, the, the faith grew. Uh, but in the 1800s, schisms emerged. Uh, and the Quaker faith really broke into a number of different parts, which you'll see mentioned here. There was the, uh, the Hicksite Quakers, and uh, that basically precipitated a, an open breach within the Quaker faith uh, called now the Great Separation. Uh, they chose to go their own way, have their own meetings, uh, have their own version of Quakerism. Uh, and that also was true of the followers of Joseph Gurney, as you see here. Uh, he was extremely liberal in his interpretation of the Quaker theology. As you mentioned, remember, I said, you know, no popery, no uh, priest, no whatever. Well, Joseph Gurney uh, was was. In, he was okay with all of that. He was okay with ministers, sacraments, baptism, communions. He uh, really uh, liberalized Quakerism uh, significantly, and he developed a following which today is known as the Evangelical Friends uh, International. And then in the late 1800s, the liberal friends came along, and as you know, the Enlightenment had taken root and everybody realized that, uh, uh, yes, there was God. Yes, there was Jesus Christ, but there was also science. And more and more science was uh, being uh, viewed as uh, uh, superseding faith in some cases. Uh, the liberal friends uh, decided that uh, the faith was more about just being good people uh, than following the strict uh, dictates of the original uh, uh, Quaker theology. Uh, and so today, about 20% of Quakers worldwide are liberal friends. Uh, certainly not anything like where Quakerism started out with George Fox back in the mid-1600s. Mid uh, so today, uh, the Society of Friends, various branches, I've mentioned two of them. There's also the Conservative Friends, the Pastoral Friends, uh, 75,000 American Quakers by some estimates today. And you see my footnote here that th this compares to the huge percentage of the North American population that were Quakers in the year 1700, according to some estimates that um, have been made, 20% of the total population of North America in 1700 were Quakers. Certainly, they've seen a dramatic diminution in the number of Quakers as a percentage of the population uh, today. Uh, interestingly, the Quaker Church, because of its uh, pacifism, uh, its support of peace throughout the world, it was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. The church was not a person, but the church was awarded 
the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, a few famous American Quakers. Some of these names might surprise you. Uh, who would have thought that James Dean <laughs> was a Quaker? Uh, who would have thought that Annie Oakley uh, was a Quaker? Uh, I mentioned how the society during the revolution had um, uh, banished some Quakers who uh, supported the revolution. Well, one of them was General Nathaniel Green, one of the most prominent generals of the Continental Army, uh, George Washington's right-hand man for all intents and purposes. Well, he was a Quaker, but he chose to fight for the cause. He chose to join the Continental Army. He led uh, the Continental Army in the Southern Campaign. Uh, he was unceremoniously kicked out uh, of the Society of Friends for having done that. Uh, another name, which is not on this list, Lydia Dara. There's an award today that the Sons of the American Revolution gives out. It's called the Lydia Dara Award. Uh, she was a female spy during the revolution, probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous female spy. Uh, she was banished from the from the Quaker faith during the actually sh shortly after the war when they found out uh, that she'd been a spy for Washington during the war. So you see these names here, some some great names uh, originating uh, in the Quaker faith. So let me take uh, the rest of my time to, to talk about uh, genealogy, researching your Quaker ancestors. Uh, and obviously there are lots and lots of online resources, not, I mean, beginning with the Society of Friends itself, you know, they have a very rich website that you can go to and, and get lots of information about both the history and you know, genealogical resources, ancestry, family search, and so forth. American ancestors, I mentioned, uh, those of you who are members, uh, it's a subscriber-based thing, obviously. Uh, I just did a course uh, back in July that they offered. It was a, a three-hour course over three separate days uh, on the genealogy, tracing your Quaker ancestors. Really uh, well done. One of the genealogists there named Rhonda McClure is incredibly gifted and knowledgeable. Uh, I would say if you're hitting a brick wall, buy an hour of Rhonda's time uh, to uh, try to break through that brick wall on your uh, research of your Quaker ancestors. And American Ancestors has lots and lots of online uh, resources specifically related to uh, the Quaker uh, uh, ancestry. There are three colleges, uh, all in Pennsylvania, Swarthmar, Bryn Mawr, and Haverford, who together uh, have created a tri-college library uh, significantly dedicated to the history and genealogy of Quakerism. The name Swarthmar, by the way, comes from Swarthmar, England, where George Fox lived. And so in honor of George Fox, uh, the college was named after uh, his residence in England. It is the uh, repository of the Friends History Library, Friends as in Society of Friends, incredibly rich treasure trove of genealogical materials on Quakerism. Uh, there is a website, quakermeetings.com, also very rich in information. And I'll get to an example of what they have online in a, in a second. Lots of books and peri periodicals. I've mentioned the reading list that uh, TMCC circulated this morning with the Zoom link. Uh, it, it includes several dozen more modern uh, texts, but also some that were more uh, contemporaneous uh, to when the movement was uh, first developing. Interesting uh, takes on Quakerism uh, in those uh, early contemporaneous records, but lots of newer books that uh, I, I would commend to your reading. It's my list. It's not anybody else's. Uh, I'm sure there are other books that are not on the list that would also be very valuable resources for you. The Quaker Quarterly, uh, I can't... Uh, access it because I'm not a member. Uh, I am told that it's a very uh, good resource for uh, Quaker history and genealogy. You need to be a member of the Friends Historical Association, not the Society of Friends, but the Historical Association. That's a $30 annual dues uh, to join that, but they go back decades and decades and decades of the Quaker quarterly. It's all online. 
and text searchable, I'm told. Uh, another hugely valuable resource is the New England Yearly Meeting Archives, as the name implies, it's focused on New England. It is housed uh, in the Rhode Island Historical Society. You remember I mentioned Roger Williams and uh, his uh, uh, the, the, the plantation attracting lots of nonconformists. Well, the Quakers, you know, over time developed a significant presence in Rhode Island. Hence, this collection is in the Rhode Island uh, Historical Society. Some of the periodicals that I pulled out of a much longer list uh, are, are here in the slide. Uh, they go back, uh, in some cases, to the early to mid 1800s. Uh, so if you're going that far back, uh, these journals uh, and, and periodicals may be of particular interest to you. They also house at the Rhode Island Historical uh, Library books, microfilm, pamphlets, photos, you know, a, a, a whole uh, long list of other uh, research materials besides books and periodicals. I've listed some a, a few other New England repositories here uh, in, that uh, I won't just read them out, but you can see them. And I mentioned the Quaker Quarterly. I found in my own research for my New England um, Quaker ancestors, these two things were particularly helpful, uh, both online at this point. Richard Statler's guide uh, to the records of the Religious Society of Friends. That's from 1997. You can get the PDF version of it if you go to this very long uh, uh, website address. Uh, don't just do neym.org or you won't get it. You have to do the whole thing. NEYM standing uh, for uh, uh, New England. I forget what it stands for. Anyway, it's a it's a very rich site, as is Quakermeetings.com. It's that one's interactive. And that's coming from uh, an earlier book uh, from Hill that's on my uh, uh, reading list. Uh, I don't know that TMCC has it, uh, but it's an index of all kinds of information about the monthly meetings. And I should uh, quickly footnote, the word meeting has a different understanding that what, than what you think it means. A meeting as in people getting together, meeting really is akin to a chapter. So uh, the if there was a chapter in, in my case, uh, Nantucket Island, it was called a meeting, not a chapter. And the meeting would meet monthly and then there would be minutes of that monthly uh, uh, get together of the of the uh, Nantucket meeting. Uh, so that's just a nomenclature issue, but that's a, a very, very rich uh, uh, website, quakermeetings.com. Here's a, a, an excerpt I took out of Statler's uh, guide. This is from the online version. Uh, I was curious to know where some of these meetings uh, were located. And so he'll have maps from all over uh, New England of where those early uh, meetings were. And you'll see uh, Nantucket in the far lower left. And then there's these other uh, dots on the map. And the lines mean that over time, that congregation, I guess I'll call it, moved from one place to another. And uh, in Rhonda McClure's uh, class that I took, she said, look, if if you have an ancestor you're researching who isn't literally in one of these specific towns that are noted, look for the one that's closest to wherever you think your ancestor lived. And there's a good bet that that ancestor would have gone to that meeting in that location. Uh, so that's just a, a, a tip uh, from one of the top genealogists at American Ancestors. And that's why the maps are there, is for you to see, hmm, where might my ancestor have gone to worship uh, with other Quakers when they weren't living in a, an obvious town that's on this map? So that's a great, uh, a great resource is the maps that you'll find in Statler's guide. Uh, I mentioned Quakermeetings.com. To the, the the image to the right is a page I just uh, downloaded of you know my <laughs> what I was 
researching, which is Nantucket. And this is one of, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of pages from QuakerMeetings.com that you can access for the specific meeting where you think your ancestor uh, might have uh, been a member of, I'll call it the congregation. And as you look down this, you'll see the, the incredible detail uh, about that particular meeting, in this case, case Nantucket. Okay, when did it start? Uh, it, when uh, was it first laid down, meaning it, it ended uh, in 1829, but you know it lasted, as you can see here from 1794, 1829. Uh, uh, it then goes on down below to where are known records today? And it lists, in this case, the Nantucket Historical Society collections. Uh, and what's in there? The women's minutes. The women's had the women had their own meetings, so there are men minutes and there are women minutes. <clears throat> and so, if your ancestor was a woman, you want to look at the women minutes. And in this case, uh, records exist for the women minutes from 1794 to 1829. Uh, marriage records are in there. I should have mentioned Quakers didn't get married in churches. They didn't get married in a civil uh, ceremony, they got married at the meetings. Uh, there would be, an I'll get to that in a second, but there'd be an intention of marriage. There'd be an examination of the couple to clear them for marriage. And then there would be a marriage, all of which took place within the confines of, uh, of the meeting and not in any sort of other public records. So if you can't find a marriage record of your Quaker ancestor, good bet it's found in these marriage records of the particular meeting uh, where your ancestor uh, might have attended uh, the, 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 the meetings. Uh, you'll also see here uh, local related histories and it will literally uh, list books that are particularly relevant to that particular meeting. The first one on my list here, Alexander Starbuck wrote the history of Nantucket County Island and town. Uh, I've actually looked at that book. It has a lot of information about Quakerism uh, on the island. So this was all put together in painstaking detail. If you can find your particular meeting or you think you found it, go to QuakerMeetings.com and you can find this additional information on where to go uh, from there. I was talking about marriage records. So yes, the intention to marry were recorded in the monthly meeting minutes. Uh, they didn't register the marriages elsewhere. So that's going to be your resource. Uh, they also had the uh, minutes of these meetings of the men and the women who were selected. It was like a little squad that was selected to determine if the, the prospective husband and wife uh, really you know, were up to snuff. Uh, and they would meet with the husband, they would meet with the wife, they'd kind of examine them, and then they would come back to the meeting and say, yeah, okay, we're clearing them. That's what it's called. They were cleared uh, for marriage. And then uh, there would be a follow-on uh, little squad put together of the uh, members who would be selected to actually attend uh, the wedding. And the wedding record itself would list all those people. And so you might see not just the name of the husband and wife, but the parents, the sisters, the brothers, the next door neighbors, whatever. Uh, they, in one case, I read there were like 60 names on the marriage certificate that were found in these meeting minutes. And then there's a register of marriage, which literally records what did the husband and wife say to each other? I mean, that's just incredible. You could be in the room essentially, uh, reading this register of marriage, what did they recite to each other? Amazing. Other types of records that are available in these meeting minutes, uh, birth and death registers, you see the list here, removals, that's when you move from someplace to another. You're going to move from Massachusetts to Rhode Island, there would be a record of that removal. There might actually be a record that you were denied removal. I'm not sure why that would occur. Disownments, I've talked about banishment, that was you know, referred to a disownment, and that would show up in the records that somebody was being banished from the faith. They were being disowned. Disciplinary records and atonement. Somebody committed uh, some um, 
uh, transgression and they would come back uh, to the meeting to seek atonement and there would be a record of that. So more than just bibliographic information about births, deaths and marriages, a much richer story to be told about your Quaker ancestor looking at these uh, particular records. I'm gonna end uh, with this uh, warning. Uh, and I picked up on this when I listened to the, when I attended the class on American ancestors. Their dating conventions are a little bit hard to follow, a little bit uh, counterintuitive, uh, but here it is. And basically, uh, they didn't use days of the week. There was no such thing as a Wednesday. It was a day of the week that was a number. Okay, so if they started with Sunday, that was the first day. Monday was called the second day. Tuesday, Wednesday would be the fourth day. And that's what we, they would call it the fourth day. So you'd know it was a Wednesday if it was referred to as the fourth day. They didn't have names for the months. There was no January, February. It was numeric. Uh, and they, uh, in the period, as you see here before 1752, they were following the Julian calendar so that the first month of the year was actually March. So if it refers to, if it referred to first month or one month, that was actually March. So if you're researching your ancestor before 1752, you got to take into account the difference between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar, which wasn't legislated into being by England and, the, and America until 1752. And I give the example here at the bottom. If you're therefore looking at a record in 1751 in America or England, and it says 25th uh, 6 Mo, what does that mean? It means August 25th of 1751. So um, I'm throwing a lot at you there, but just be aware of the dating convention, which can throw a curveball at you if you don't know these rules. Okay, uh, Suzanne, if there's some questions, I'll try to field them, or I have my email address on here if you want to send me an email afterwards with a question, or if you want more information about anything I've talked about, um, or a PDF right away of this slide deck, I'll be happy to send it to you. But uh, Suzanne, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, well, some comments as well as questions. Uh, Bridget happened to mention that the Herbert Hoover presidential site in Iowa includes a Quaker meeting house. Well, how about that? My Some of my ancestors were from Iowa, but they were Methodists. So, but that's good to know. And then Lisa made a comment. Uh, she says, with the equality a tenant of faith, were women allowed to own property? Are there records with women's names only attached and were they allowed to vote? Uh, great question. They could own property. Um, and in fact, William Penn's wife owned lots and lots of acreage uh, that she inherited and kept. Uh, didn't belong to William, which was one of the normal conventions of the day. You marry the woman and you take all of her property. Uh, Quick Quakers didn't, wouldn't do, didn't do that. Um, the other two parts, Suzanne, they were vote. I don't, I don't know that they, well, they certainly had a right to vote within the context of the meeting. As I mentioned, uh, women staffed some of these committees. They had their own meetings. They voted on things that came before uh, their women's committees, and they could uh, vote for or against uh, a marriage, for example. So at least within the confines of the Quaker faith, yes, they they had voting privileges. Uh, her other part of the question was, are there records with women's names only attached? I uh, say well, I, I'll take the example of the women's meetings. Uh, they they had their own meetings and their names would be appearing there as just women, if that's the question. And of course, the marriage record would show their maiden name. Yes. You know, it's not like New England where the husband was John Smith and then the wife was Goody Smith. No, that, that's not the convention they followed. Okay, and George made a comment that uh, he'd always assumed Pennsylvania was named for William Penn and not his father, so he appreciates you clearing that up. Yeah, um, I mean, there was there was a, there was actually a lot of uh, uh, 
fur flying about what to call this colony. Uh, and there were lots of other names that were bandied about, and it was William Penn's desire for whatever reason. I, I haven't dug down on it. He wanted to call it Sylvania. Uh, and, and that's when the king intervened and said, well, let's, let's throw your father's name on there. <laughs> so he did. Okay. And Lisa uh, wants to know, you had mentioned earlier in the presentation about your Salem Witch Trials presentation. She wants yes. to know if that's recorded and if she can watch it online. Uh, well, yes and no. It was recorded uh, out of respect for our guest speaker. They, uh, she did not, she asked that we not widely disseminate uh, the videotape. Uh, so our intent is to distribute it only with her permission to those who attended and also the members of the four co-sponsoring organizations uh, which uh, besides American Heritage Partners, it was the Nevada Mayflower Society, the Nevada Sons of the American Revolution, the Nevada Order of Founders and Patriots of America, uh, and last but not least, Suzanne, your organization, uh, the Nevada uh, uh, State Genealogical Society. Okay, answered her question, thank you. Uh, we had asked earlier, uh, before we started the recording, how many people in the class had Quaker ancestors or were Quaker descendants themselves. And uh, Lisa wanted to say, my recently passed uncle, my dad's brother, was a Quaker. Um, I also found some Quaker records for the 1700s and 1800s from my ancestors. So she was real pleased about that. And Wendy says her Goddard line has Quakers. And uh, let's see here. Uh, Edith said, um, I live in Fallon and I'm a member of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. My particular interest in this program today, oh, I think she's just talking, yes, about papers. Uh, my particular interest in this program today is that I found out that my Mayflower line included a number of Quakers. Interestingly, they uh, lose their Quakerism after they come in contact with a man credited with starting the first religious services in Wayne County, Pennsylvania, when it was considered wilderness. Um, the man was Hans Ulrich Swingle, and supposedly he was descended from the great Swiss reformer Hans Ulrich, and I hope I pronounced this right, Z, spelled Z-W-I-N-G-L-I. -I. Uh, Hans uh, started a German reformed church in Wayne County, Pennsylvania, so I'm wondering what attracted these Quakers to his services? Uh, well, let me, let me start with a preamble, which is Pennsylvania is certainly known today as uh, a destination for lots of German in, immigrants. Uh, many of them fought for and against uh, the cause during the revolution. But, you know, one of the original German settlements was literally Germantown. Uh, and uh, they were not Quakers uh, by, by and large, but uh, they, they, in fact, at, at some point they came to blows, metaphorically speaking, with William Penn, but um, uh, if the question is why, why might these Germans have been interested in Quakerism? Well, it's for the very reason that you know it, it was anti-aristocracy at at its core, much like Calvinism was anti-aristocracy. Uh, it was you know a people's faith uh, as opposed to the Church of England and the Anglican faith, which to some people's reckoning was you know, very heavy handed. And I can imagine a German immigrant uh, might wish to not be under the thumb uh, of the Church of England and all of its uh, uh, diktats. Uh, I'm not sure if, I, if, if I'm answering the question, but that's my speculation. Okay, uh, Bridget commented that she herself is not a Quaker, but she has a lifelong friend who lived near Poughkeepsie, New, Poughkeepsie, Poughkeepsie excuse me, New York. Uh, became a member of her local friends meeting. That's kind of nice. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, and Edith mentioned, I'm not a Quaker, but have found I have quite a few ancestors that were. I meet, I met a dis distant cousin with the surname, uh, Soleil, um, S-O-U-L-E, I probably mispronounced that. Uh, my Mayflower ancestor is George, who said she is a Quaker. Well, you see, as when we give these talks, uh, we realize that going back whatever 10 generations quakerism was quite substantial i mean num the numbers of 
adherence, quite substantial. And I'm going to speculate again that if you're researching your ancestors, your male ancestors during the Revolutionary War era, and they are of the right age where they should have been in the war fighting, and they weren't, there's at least an even chance it's because they were Quakers. Great tip. Uh, let's see here. Holly mentions in the comment section, not a Quaker, but descended from Roger Kirk and Jean Bowen Kirk via their oldest daughter, Abigail Kirk Corbley. Right. And some of those famous people I had on that one slide, you know, famous Quakers, I want to, you know, word of caution, some of them are their parents were Quakers or their descendants of Quakers, and they proudly will say, you know, I'm either a Quaker or I'm descended from Quakers. Bonnie Raitt actually converted to Quakerism. Go figure. I can get, uh, I'm, I'm going off topic here. Joan Baez was on that list. I was a big fan of Joan Baez. She was obviously very anti-war. We know that. One of the most prominent anti-war uh, activists. You can understand why she might be attracted to Quakerism because of its pacifism. Gosh, I, one of my very favorite songs are she did uh, Diamonds and Rust. Yep. Song. Uh, okay, uh, DLB says in the chat box, I'm not a Quaker, but my ancestors were. Wonderful. And uh, I, I actually have a few questions, Jake. Could you kind of go into a little bit more, if you can, uh, about what forms of discipline uh, and, and how is it administered? Uh, well, it, it, it's not like Catholicism where you say X number of Hail Marys, uh, not that kind of discipline. But, you know, they, they would, uh, you know, admonish. They would, you know, suspend your privileges of attending meetings uh, they could, uh, you know, call you in on the carpet with uh, your parents uh, and admonish the parents to correct whatever the behavior was. I don't have specific examples uh, to to call out for you, Suzanne, but you know, you know, it was not you know violent. They weren't obviously hanging people. Uh, that there was no, no such thing as executions. Uh, within the Quaker faith. So it was, you know, a nonviolent form of discipline, if that makes any sense. So what kind of atonement would they make? Uh, well, as in any uh, faith, uh, re-pledging uh, yourself to uh, God's word and to follow uh, God's teachings and to follow your, your your faith's teachings, you know, to the letter, uh, and you won't do it again. I mean, that's an atonement. Okay, we've got lots more comments coming in here. Oh, uh, great. DLB wants to know, one of my ancestors, oh, no, he just wants to share it with us. One of my ancestors helped start a Quaker meeting in Tennessee. And In, uh, in, in the, in the uh, southern slave states. That's That's interesting. And Tracy uh, said, if a Quaker left the friends, what religion did they typically adopt? Oh, gosh, I, I couldn't even uh, speculate. Uh, you know, I mentioned Calvinism a few times. Uh, I, I kind of, I, I, I don't want to pass myself off as a theologian, but I would argue that Calvinism is kind of a close kissing cousin to Quakerism in terms of their belief system that what is the controlling uh, doctrine is only what was in the Bible. That's why Calvinists rejected the Church of England with all of its forms of popery uh, and uh, bishops and uh, priests and baptisms, all of which the Calvinists would say were not in the Bible. Um, and the Quakers took a similar view on that. And that's one reason that they were not Anglicans, as they did not believe in all those trapper, trappings of popery. OK. 
Okay. Uh, Barbara Jo says, my Society of Friends ancestor was born in 1644. Were there meetings I can research from that early date? Uh, well, you recall I was talking about George uh, Fox not really coming up with the Quaker theology until his uh, vision in 16, what did I say, 57? So I, I, I guess I would rather doubt that there was anything in the 1640s, uh, Barbara Joe, that would, would be pertinent. And looking back at my um, slide here, yeah, the, the the Pendle Hill vision was 1652. Okay, he was born in 1644. So we'll add 20 years to that. Or 1660, somewhere around there. Yeah, well, that, right. good good point. I was just counting birth record, uh, birth date. Uh, yes, I mean, the 1660s, all hell was breaking loose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll make a note of that. <laughs> But they were they were developing meetings at that time, and that was thanks to George Fox. He wanted to put some structure uh, into place, and they would have this thing called the yearly meeting, which was the massive big meeting. I'm not qu quite sure what the modern analogy uh, to that would be, uh, but it all it was kind of a bottoms up uh, formal structure. You start with your local meeting. Uh, with your monthly meeting, and then there were the quarterly meetings, and then there was the yearly meeting, and there were records for all of those, but your 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 best bet for getting the kind of detail that will speak to your particular ancestor would be in the monthly meeting minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and George says, I have Quaker ancestors, Addington and Burson from Bucks County, PA, to Union, Newberry Counties, SC, by way of Fairfax, Virginia. Wonderful. And, and Bucks County, by the way, was uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll digress for, for a second. The story of Pennsylvania is also the story of Delaware. And they were originally called the lower counties. They were also part of William Penn's proprietorship. And he had a ongoing uh, war of words with Lord Baltimore in Maryland over who controlled that area that became Delaware. And of course, Bucks County is, you know, right across the Delaware River. So there was a lot of tension going on in those early years in that uh, that area, that neck of the woods, if you will, uh, where Quakerism was on the rise. But Lord Baltimore was an Anglican, and he he did everything possible to insinuate himself into the lower counties and that area of Bucks County to turn them against William Penn and the Quaker faith, because he wanted to take it all over. So lots of political strife. Okay, uh, Bernie uh, just commented, excellent presentation. Uh, George, George from California says, I'm currently researching a possible connection to the Lamb family, who also followed the PA, uh, Virginia, South Carolina migration pattern. I've discovered possible connection through DNA matches. Wonderful. You know, Suzanne, at some point you might want to gather all this information and have a genealogy lab um, paper on all of these great Quaker connections people contributing their stories to you. Do a book on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, DLB wants to uh, comment on uh, my Morgan Quakers were from, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing this right, Radnorshire, R-A-D-N-O-R-S-H-I-R-E, Wales, and they purchased land in Pennsylvania. I also have Evans uh, and others who were Quakers. Great, and speaking of Wales, so, when George Fox first got rolling, uh, or strike that, when, when William Penn first got rolling, he, he was actually you know, a government agent in Ireland where his father had sent him to try to uh, uh, acquire lands for the Penn family and administer them. And while he was in Ireland, you know, he, he, I don't want to say single-handedly, but he really caused Quakerism to grow exponentially in Ireland and Wales. Uh, there was kind of a, a, a 
symbiotic relationship between the Welch and the Irish Quakers because they were right across the water from each other, of course. Okay, uh, Edith wanted to uh, clarify her earlier comment. She says Hans Aldrich uh, was Swiss and came through New York into northeastern Pennsylvania. Swiss, okay. Well, you know, that area of the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the Delaware River in particular, it was a melting pot. It had Swedes, it had Swiss, it had French, it had Germans. Uh, it, really quite remarkable. And when England took over New Netherland in 1664, one of the first thing they did was go down river and oust all of these foreigners and took control of the area as best they could. There were actually Swedish forts and they called it New Sweden. And England had very low tolerance for that. So it basically killed uh, New Sweden in the, in the, in the crib. Okay, uh, MJB says, Sylvania means woods from Latin. So Pennsylvania would be Penn's woods. There you go. Thank you for that insight. I didn't research that. Uh, and DLB says, my Quaker Morgan ancestor did not fight, but he was an Indian guide during the Revolutionary War. Well, that would make him a non-believer. Any, any support given, it could be food, it could be shelter, it could be clothes, it could be any manner of help delivered to the enemy was in violation of their faith. Yes, I would agree with you because they eventually took the oath of allegiance. <laughs> so, well, that would do it. <laughs> I'm sure he left the faith. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would do it right there. Okay, uh, Wendy has an interesting comment. She says, my Goddard and wife moved to Farmham, Quebec. Uh, Belinda Kittridge Goddard is buried at the Quaker Meeting House Cemetery. Why did they move to Canada? Uh, um, Grandpa yeah. Goddard said they were loyalists. Why loyalists and to who? The king, I would assume. Well, and one of my slides used that word loyalist, and it's not because they necessarily were fighting for the British. They weren't because that's against their faith. But they also had a creed that said that one should not disturb a sitting government. I, I'm, not, I'm not using the correct terminology, but if given the choice between uh, supporting the king and supporting a rebel or a rebellion, they would err on the side of stability. I guess I'd use that word. And so... They were branded loyalists, I suppose, for that reason. And you're right, many of them fled to Canada, uh, not not just after the war, when when the, when the, when the, uh, the English were uh, defeated, but during the war, because they were getting persecuted, like I said. Uh, she also made a comment that her daughter uh, goes to George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon. Ask her then why, of all the places in the United States, Oregon landed George Fox University. I'm intrigued. I'd like to know. I'd like to know that too. So that's one thing I'll be working on. So seeing why it's why it's there, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. But you know the the Belinda Kittredge Goddard that moved to Camp Quebec. She wasn't born until 1805. Okay, well, so that had nothing that had to do with the revolution. Yeah. No, it had nothing to do with the Revolutionary War, now that I'm looking at that. so. Well, remember I said that there were lots of schisms then developing in the early 1800s. And it could be that, I, I don't know this for a fact, you know, the Hicksite Quakers who came to be uh, in the early 1800s, uh, I think they were progressives and were uh, going in lots of different directions geographically. Okay, uh, Edith has another comment on her uh, all reach. Uh, Hans uh, Swingle was Swiss, but came to North America by way of Germany and came into Northeastern Pennsylvania by way of New York, not Philadelphia. Right, well, Philadelphia is kind of up there in that quadrant, uh, but Right, and Bucks County is up above it, I believe. I, I, I have my map in my mind here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Philadelphia obviously was the population center and it was 
William Penn's dream to develop that city. There were actually people living in caves on the river itself because they didn't have they didn't have their land yet. They were trying to get land. So the next best thing was to go live in a cave. And there was lots of political uh, back and forth about whether to oust these Quakers from their caves. Gosh, we got a lot of good questions here. Uh, DLB says uh, in the book, Marion in the Welsh Tract, page 358, it states, Sarah Jones, daughter of John Evans and uh, Delitha, or Delila, uh, Sarah Evans, whose father, John, uh, hold on, uh, Evan and Delita, her mother, was disowned in 1694 for allowing daughter Sarah to marry her first cousin. However, he did name her in his will. Well, that's an example of disownment. Uh, that that was uh, a transgression, and I suppose another avenue that the meeting might have taken is to discipline them, but it sounds like whatever the meeting was, they decided they had gone too far and they disowned them. Okay, Tracy says, when the German Palatine, Palatines arrived in Pennsylvania, did they frequently convert to the Friends or did they stick with their own, uh, probably a Lutheran religion? I don't know, uh, is the short answer. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was an interesting hundred years as Quakerism first took root in Pennsylvania and then it was in the ascendancy and then more non-believers, more non-Quakers were coming into the territory you know, seeking opportunity, wanting more land, uh, opposed to Quakerism for that reason, because they stood in the way of what they wanted to do in the new world. Uh, I just don't, I don't know the statistics, but uh, over the 1800s, the total number of Quakers declined dramatically, uh, which, which tells me that uh, over, you know, the first half of the 1800s, more immigrants we're not converting to Quakerism than were by far. Okay, DLB says, under the Welsh naming tradition, a daughter would be Sarah, daughter of John. Thus, she would be Sarah John, and John was later changed to Jones in American tradition. Uh, I don't know <laughs> about that one. Um, I mean, we know that the English surnames often came from their trade or profession, you know, Smiths uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know about Jones. Okay, and Tracy says, I agree with Jonathan that the recent three-week class on Quakers by McClure for American ancestors was excellent. It was recorded, and if you can contact them, they will make it available for a fee. That's great. Yeah, I, I actually went on the website before this talk to see if they posted it for free and they hadn't. Uh, so they may charge you. I just don't know whoever uh, asked that question or, or made that comment. I don't know if they'll give it to you for free because I think I had to pay 60 bucks <laughs> to attend class. Yeah, she said available for a fee. There you go, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dave, um, I have no papers in my family that I know of. However, I am often uh, finding genealogical research in ongoing, Excuse me, hold on, I gotta move a little window around here. In ongoing and continues to reveal, hold on, I gotta get rid of that little emblem there, hold on. For some reason I can't get rid of it. Oh, there it is, okay. Um, however, I am often uh, finding genealogical research is ongoing and continues to reveal things I would not known or even heard of or, uh, as rumored. So excellent talk, he says. Uh, Thank Casey. You. Uh, my Quaker ancestor was disowned for dancing. I've nicknamed him Bad Benjamin. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. When you go back to Puritanism and, and the pilgrims and so forth, dancing was forbidden there, too. I mean, this was a pretty sober crowd up in New England. You know, no dancing. You know, certainly no, you couldn't play ball, no games. You know, it, it was just very, very severe you know, as, as far as the culture went. Procreating was all right, though. <laughs> Procreating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Bill has an interesting uh, bit of information here. He says, George Fox University was founded in 1891 as Pacific College by Quakers who had settled in Newburgh in the 1870s. 
In 1885, they had established Friends Pacific Academy, a boarding school that included Herbert Hoover among its students. Yeah, and my 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 head scratching is why not why not uh, in Pennsylvania? Why not someplace else? Uh, there could have been multiple George Fox universities given his prominence in the faith. I mean, we know that there were three colleges in Pennsylvania that I mentioned, Swarthmore and Haverford and so forth, uh, that that honored him in some way, but they didn't call themselves George Fox University. I thought that was interesting. Okay, DLB has another comment. He says, uh, Marion in the Welsh track, a uh, Welsh barony of PA uh, settled by the, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing, Crimstrick, C-Y-M-R-I-C Quakers in 1682. The ebook is available through Google Books. So if anyone's interested in Marion in the Welsh track, you can get it on Google Books. Okay, uh, any other questions? Why we have a, a good amount of questions today. That's wonderful. Well, I re really appreciate everybody's interest in the topic. I mean, I've been on a, <laughs> I like to say, I first started doing serious genealogical research on my family lines over 40 years ago, and I keep discovering new stuff. And the, the Quaker line that I discovered was relatively recent, and it was one of those, oh my gosh, I have Quakers. And I'll I'll bet, you know, with some more research, a lot of the people listening in might d have a similar, you know, discovery, similar uh, eureka moment. It's an interesting faith. I have tremendous respect for what they did digging out this new faith in the face of just such massive persecution. I've said to Suzanne, I'd be happy to talk at some point in the future about the Huguenots, which is another one of those stories of courage in the face of just horrific persecution. So um, I'm kind of on that theme right now of uh, talking about, you know, the tragic uh, stories of some of my ancestors, my Quakers included. A couple more just came in. Uh, George says, did you mention Earl Ham College in Richmond, Indiana? It's a Quaker institution. We had an at Addington reunion meet there years ago. I didn't mention it, but good to know. Okay, and uh, DLB says, I can't wait to check out the resources you've provided. This has been a very interesting presentation. Again, thank you so much for your time and attention. Okay, well, uh, let me, Jay, if you don't mind, let's give it a few more seconds to see if any last minute questions come in. And while we're waiting, uh, I wanna remind the class uh, that uh, if you are going to leave at this point, and you're more than welcome to stay, but if you're going to leave at this point, uh, if there's anything in the chat box that you want uh, before you leave, please download the chat box. You can do that by clicking on the three little dots at the bottom of your chat box. Uh, if you can't get that three little dots to work, you can always just copy and paste the entire chat box and then paste it into an email and email it to yourself. Uh, the class does go on for several more hours. If you're new to the class today for the first time, the second half of the class is where we call it the open lab, where we all work together on our family trees to help solve uh, issues that we cannot resolve on our own individually. Or sometimes we just talk about hot genealogy topics for the day. Uh, so everyone is welcome to stay. And Jay, I don't see any more questions coming into the chat box. So I'm gonna say thank you very, very much once again for a wonderful presentation. You're all one of my very favorite guest presenters and we always appreciate your support of the program. And I'll also thank you for allowing us to record today. That was very much appreciated as well. You're very welcome and look forward to uh, next time. All right. Then I'll, I'll let everyone know that if you'd uh, like to stay for the class, please do. Uh, if you're going to be leaving us at this point in time, all you got to do is click on the red end button and I will end the recording at this time. And we'll see you in a few moments, hopefully.